Hi everybody, welcome to our backyard. It's so wonderful to be filming outside. This is actually one of the spots where I sit and watch birds. I take pictures of birds as well. I was actually just taking pictures of wrens picking up nesting material and checking out one of our bird houses. So this episode, we'll be talking a lot about nesting birds. What do you do when you find a baby bird on the ground? Well, first you have to examine whether it's a nestling or a fledgling. If you see no feathers and you can still see the skin of the bird, then it's a nestling. It's best to put it back in the nest that it fell out from. It's probably somewhere close by. If the nest is destroyed, you can actually try rebuilding it and putting the baby bird uh, back there. The parents are probably somewhere close by. If the parents have been killed and you don't see them for some time, then you can call your local rehabilitation center and bring the baby bird there. And if you see feathers on the baby bird, then it's a fledgling. This is actually what happened to us last year on June 5th. Our dog was barking like mad, so we rushed outside and fair enough, we found a fledgling robbing on our lawn, not too far from uh, our cedar hedge. Uh, robins nest in our cedar hedges all the time. There's actually a pair there right now. To protect the baby bird from our dog and our kids and direct sunlight, we actually moved it to a, a shady, more protected area next to hostas. Uh, we always wear gloves when we handle wild birds or anything to do with them. And we also knew that the parents were close by and were probably still feeding uh, the robin. And actually the next day it was already gone, so probably it moved on to something. So that's what you can do with fledglings. If they're somewhere in a very exposed open area, just move it somewhere more protected. Charlene Hall found a cowboard egg in one of her uh, finches nests, so she's wondering if she should do anything about it. Hi Charlene. I'm going to make a wild guess that the finches you referred to are house finches because of two reasons. First, house finches commonly nest in flower boxes and planters and among flowering plants in people's backyards. And second, they are commonly parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds to the tune of about one quarter of all their nests. This means that the latter species, which does not make its own nest, lays its eggs in the nests of other species, 220 of them to be exact. It's not really a good thing for the host species if only because the main goal of all wildlife species is to pass their genes on to the next generation. If the cowbird nestling does outcompete the host young to their detriment, then the finch pair ends up raising some other species youngster and not their own nestlings containing their genes. As for you removing the cowbird egg to help out the finches, I can give you three reasons why you should not do so. First and foremost, it's totally illegal to tamper with the nest and eggs of any migratory bird species, including house finches and even cowbird eggs. Second, the cowbird's parasitic behavior is a natural process, and we really should not interfere with it. Brown-headed cowbirds, which are far too often vilified by the public, but are in fact quite interesting birds, they deserve to live too, right? Here's one more reason. One study suggests that if you remove the cowbird egg, there is a chance that the house finches might desert their nest. But let me leave you with some good news. A study in southern Ontario in the mid-1990s found that while 85% of cowbird eggs do hatch in house finch nests, the vast majority of the cowbird nestlings do not fare well, mainly because the host parent's diet is not that appropriate for them. So the bottom line is, we should just let nature take its course and simply enjoy the drama and the intrigue of it all. Our town is really pushing for the no more May, which of course we are super happy about because our backyard right now is covered in dandelions, bees, and robins are just everywhere. So I hope that you've been able not to cut grass, at least somewhere in your backyard. Another thing that we've discovered after the winter is that we have these bare patches all over our property. So instead of seeding them with grass, we decided to use clover. 
Well, clover is pretty, I find. It attracts pollinators, it doesn't require much watering, and it also brings nitrogen back into the soil, making it all nice and healthy. I have been fortunate enough to spend a fair bit of time traveling in the tropical regions of countries in Central and South America, and I have, like most people who travel there, noticed that the feathers of the birds that live there appear to be a lot more vibrantly colorful than in countries north of the equator or toward the South Pole. Obviously, I was not the first to observe this. In fact, three very famous biologists, Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, and Alexander von Humboldt, each independently recorded that same observation back in the 1800s, and they concluded that animals in general were more colorful the closer one got to the equator. So a team of biologists led by Christopher Cooney of the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom decided to study this apparent phenomenon by digitally photographing adult male and female specimens of more than 4,500 species of songbird from all over the world, ranging from the really colorful uh, paradise tanagers living in the tropics, just kidding, and the rather bland colored dippers found in North America. The team used cutting edge computer technology called deep learning to measure the shade and intensity of plumage colors in each photo in terms of red, green, and blue light, and even ultraviolet color, which we now know that birds can commonly perceive. This allowed them to generate an estimate of colorfulness in the plumage of each individual bird and relate it to where the birds live. The UK team essentially found that the plumages of birds living at the equator were 20 to 30 percent more colorful than those living in higher latitudes, whether to the north or to the south. The bottom line? They basically corroborated the beliefs of Darwin, Russell Wallace, and von Humboldt. But why are birds more colorful in the tropics, you might ask? According to Cooney, it may have to do with the need for bright visual communication in dark tropical forests, as well as the ability of tropical birds to acquire color-forming compounds in their diet from fruits and floral nectar. But he added that this phenomenon may no longer be a given, because we don't yet know the potential impacts of climate warming on the availability of these foods. Together with the ravens, crows, and magpies, jays belong to the corvid family, or I call it the smart family. I'm sure all of us here will agree that jays are loud, sociable, and domineering birds. They love to announce their arrival, and here in our backyard, we always know when a blue jay is about to descend upon our bird feeders. Here in North America, we have the following jays. Blue jays, California scrub jays, Canada jays, Florida scrub jays, green jays, Mexican jays, pinion jays, stellus jays, and Woodhouse's scrub jays. Scrub jays got their name because of their preferred habitat, scrub. Today we'll concentrate on the most widespread and most popular jays, stellus in the west and blue jays here in the east. Stellus jays were discovered by a German botanist, George Wilhelm Steller. He found them in Alaska in the 18th century. Of all the jays, only Stellus jays and blue jays have a crest. And the crest is normally down when birds are engaged in a peaceful activity, and the crest goes up if they're dealing with a stressful situation. Also, pay attention to their tails. They tend to raise them and flicker and, and swing them when dealing with some kind of a disturbance. Sexes of both Stellas and Blue Jays look pretty much the same. Females are just a tad smaller. Also, Jays tend to get bigger if you travel from south to north of the continent. Stellars and Blue Jays are omnivorous. They are notorious for snatching up bird eggs and nestlings. This time of the year is when they consume a lot of calcium, so please remember to put out boiled eggshells, maybe they will leave other birds alone. Robins that are nesting in our cedar hedge have been fighting off blue jays for the past week or so. Both jays visit bird feeders. They're crazy about peanuts. They also love acorns and will happily eat wasps, beetles, bees, grasshoppers, and spiders. 
Both species of jay are monogamous. They start building their nests in March and can go all the way to the beginning of June. Stella's jays tend to have only one brood. They will try to have another brood if something had happened to the first one. Whereas blue jays tend to have two broods and in Florida, three broods are not that uncommon. Stella's jays, both sexes look for a nesting site in blue jays, it's just a female, but in both species, both sexes help each other build a nest. Males are very protective of their females. They also feed them when they sit on eggs and they help out with feeding the chicks. Both species lay about two to five eggs per clutch. Uh, Stella's jays fledge when they're about 16 days old and blue jays between 17 and 21 days old. All right, time to say goodbye. Just a quick follow-up uh, on robins eating at bird feeders. So a few of us sent us pictures and videos of robins eating all sorts of things. Dave O'Neill actually sent us videos and pictures of robins eating peanuts at his bird feeders. Yeah, robins have been up to all sorts of things uh, this year. Anyway, our photo contest is also open. It's hardworking parents. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in two weeks.